Gabrielle Crawford, who is a trailblazing woman in virtual production as well as a sportsman scholar coming from Beijing to be here today. She has collaborated with Oscar Billy Makers, pioneered the virtual human industry abroad, contributed as a team operator and technical artist for major Netflix production, and served as a virtual production lead at the Circle. Currently, Gabrielle is partnering with Chinese companies to enhance their virtual production capabilities. You might be asking yourself, what is virtual production? Well, that's my cue to hand the mic over to your professional. Let's welcome Gabrielle to share how her speech titled Having a Job with No Description, why your profession is more than a label. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here today and speak with all of you. So, the holidays are coming up. And for me, as with many people, they bring lots of excitement and eating and existential dread. Or at least they used to. I used to dread the moment that my grandma or my aunt would ask me to describe what I do for work. Or, better yet, listening to my parents trying to describe my job. I would watch them go through all five stages of grief as they try to explain why I have chosen to forsake the family path of becoming a lawyer to instead pursue a made-up career. I'll demonstrate. Why did she study computer science if not to be handed many thousands of dollars and work at a company that can serve as her job description? She works at Google, no follow-up questions needed. She works at Brud, Pixamundo, the third floor. Aunt Linda has questions. Every time I ask her what she does for work, what she says changes. Is this a prank? Does she even know what she does? If I throw in the words CGI, VFX, AI, am I covered? Is it too late for her to apply to med school, business school, or law school? Okay, I actually haven't a clue what virtual production is, and I need an exit strategy from this conversation. So I'm going to say, a, filmmaker, B, computer scientist, C, video game developer, or D, something to do with AI. Now, none of these are technically incorrect, but they also do not at all describe what I do. I've given quite a few talks on virtual production at this point, and every time I prepare for the next one, I reflect on how I've described it to audiences before. It never helps. I always tailor how I define the industry to the audience that I'm speaking towards, because, in fact, virtual production is many things. When preparing for this talk, I was going through my files, and I found this Google Doc that my team and I from my previous company made trying to internally define what virtual production is, and this is the first thing that we wrote. What's virtual production? Copy out. Virtual production can mean different things depending on who you talk to, and the context to which you're referring. <coughs> Helpful. <laughs> you know it's a complicated industry when the definition of your field begins with a caveat. However, I will do my best to briefly describe to you what virtual production is. So, virtual production is the true marriage of computer science and filmmaking. Virtual production is a combination of computer-aided production and filmmaking visualization techniques. It allows us to combine live production and some elements of visual effects. So, in a live action production, we are not, instead of using a green screen, we have this world that we've built digitally inside of a game engine like Unreal Engine, and we are rendering that in real time behind the actors on this massive LED screen. So that's what we're seeing in these images here. On the left, you see more of a traditional visual effects pipeline using a green screen, um, and you, on the right, you see a virtual production shoot. So they are not on, they're not in a forest. They are currently in a virtual production volume, and all of the dead trees behind him are actually created and then rendered in real time through virtual production on the LED stage. And you can see that more clearly in this image. Um, you can see the demarcation of the LED screen and the LED ceiling. And the rocks that the set design has placed that he's sitting on help integrate more seamlessly with the rocks that are rendered digitally in real time on the LED screen behind. So many people equate virtual production with real-time visual effects because of this real-time component. 
and live action. Again, we are taking this world that we've created digitally and bringing it to the live action shoot. And in animation, we're basically doing the inverse, which is that we are taking live action set components and techniques and bringing them into our digital and animated world. So for if I'm on an animated shoot or a, or a live action shoot, my role differs, but it also can differ day to day or even hour by hour. Um, it's typical for me to spend part of my day working and programming a tool that we can use an engine to accomplish a task or a particular aesthetic that is required by a scene, and then the other half doing more stereotypically creative endeavors, such as working hand-in-hand -hand with the director and cinematographer to discuss camera angles, building out the environment, creating characters, lighting a scene, coming up with new creative concepts, and so on. And so in order to successfully straddle these two parallel spheres, I need to be in equal parts a filmmaker and a computer scientist. Unfortunately, I am. People often ask how I found myself in virtual production. The industry as it stands is very new, and I have been in it since early on. So I studied both computer science and film as an undergraduate, and I was fortunate to do so at a university that is well known in both fields. Now, this was not a combined major. I studied them separately. So in my computer science courses, I was creating apps, studying discrete math. I mean, the closest thing that came to film was in my video game development courses. And then for film, it was much the same story. I was writing, directing, and producing my own films. Each program was incredibly rigorous. And I actually had faculty for both departments, both engineering and film, tell me that I should drop one or the other. They said, the fact that I was trying to pursue both sent a message that I wasn't serious about either. Now, I am so happy that I did not listen to them. It's really hard when the people that you look up to and that have already had so much success in your chosen fields don't understand or support the path that you are trying to forge. People now tell me that I am so lucky to have studied both. How fortuitous is it that there is now an entire industry that is reliant on the two fields of study that I decided to pursue? Now, I didn't know that virtual production specifically would exist, but I knew that there would be an important intersection between film and computer science, and I wanted to be the person to bridge it. I was so lucky to find a mentor in the incredible Academy Award-winning VFX supervisor, Michael Fink. He saw my path and understood it and encouraged me, I think in large part because much of his own success came from ingeniously integrating new and innovative tech into film. He was the first person to introduce me to virtual production. My first real job was actually not in film at all. It was at a startup called Brud, working on Michaela, a self-described 19-year-old robot that is now credited with kickstarting the now thriving virtual human industry. I hadn't set out to work on virtual humans. My passion lay in filmmaking and storytelling. But Bread wanted to use an advanced virtual production to disrupt the media landscape. It was, again, difficult to describe to my friends, family members, and classmates why I was not pursuing a job in film currently, but instead creating a virtual influencer. But the startup ended up being the perfect playground to build my virtual production and future career. The small team size and culture of perpetual learning allowed me to occupy both engineering and artistic roles. In the evolving landscape of virtual production, roles are actually just starting to be defined and job interviews will actually try and fit me into either an engineering position or an artistic position. But I stand firm in saying that I do both, and I credit my board managers for instilling this belief in me, that I don't have to decide. I've come to realize that job descriptions and roles are just made-up constructs, and that my value lies in being a bridge between these roles. Trusting yourself is key, you bring a unique skill set 
and perspectives that uh, companies might not fully understand initially. I later had the absolute pleasure of serving as main operator and technical artist for Netflix's upcoming live action adaptation of Avatar The Last Airbender. This was one of the first virtual production projects of this scale. A huge percentage of the show was filmed using virtual production technology and on the world's largest virtual production volume, so using the world's largest LED stage. Introducing filmmakers who are deeply rooted in old Hollywood methodologies to this new form of filmmaking required diplomacy and patience. The double-edged sword of not having one clearly defined role meant that I impacted different aspects of production, a task that was at times stressful and demanding. Learning to reframe new ideas and uh, methodologies in terms of familiar ones became crucial as did the realization that sometimes seeing is believing. For instance, things that seemed very clear to my, myself and my team members only became so to people that are new to virtual production once they saw it in action. However, to reach this stage, you have to have the confidence and follow through in your ideas to take them and realize them. Challenges persist, oh, this is again, the largest, world's largest virtual production stage where we filmed Avatar The Last Airbender and the team that I worked with. Now, people are excited by and believe in virtual production. USC offering a course in virtual production and NYU offering an entire master's program surrounding virtual production are clear markers that the industry is investing in this new form of technology and filmmaking. I now have examples of virtual production use in TV and movie that I can use to explain to my friends and family what I do when they're having a bit of a hard time. However, this was not always the case. Up until now, it often felt like I was striving towards a goal that only I could see. And yet, I think as I continue advancing in my career, this will always be the case. Always striving towards a goal and down a path that people don't quite understand yet because it hasn't been normalized yet. Challenges pursue and persist, especially in the face of AI and future technological innovation. We also now live in a world that has become a pendulum between globalization and decoupling. This is true in the film market as well. So I'm Schwarzman Scholar, which is a one-year funded master's program at Tsinghua founded with the belief that an understanding of China's role in global trends is essential for leaders across all sectors. I studied and um, focused on China's role in the global film industry, the weight of which changes year to year. People may not understand why I am prioritizing forging global connections in the film industry, but I have come to embrace the uncomfortable operating in the unknown. I ironically have found that despite working in real-time technology, success does not always happen in real time. People may not understand what you do until much later on. Don't allow yourself to be pigeonholed. The challenge is real, as people might not be initially receptive to your ideas or the future that you envision for yourself. Challenge yourself not to just take the established path. Instead, be a perpetual learner and explorer, allowing yourself and your career to advance and change year by year. Remember, the future that others don't see is the one that you have the opportunity to create. Thank you.